This video is kindly sponsored by Keeps. Find out more later on. Hey, 42 here. Life is full of awful events. On any given day, you might get hit by a bus, mauled by a tiger, or asphyxiated by a vengeful olive in your martini. You could get dumped, fired, or thrown into prison for indecent exposure. Again, your flat white could be cold and your beer could be warm. You might put your duvet into the cover the wrong way around and have to start all over again. The list is endless and, quite frankly, bloody terrible. But as dreadful as these experiences are, and as hard as it is to believe, there are even bigger incidents that threaten not only your well-being, but the safety of the entire human race. A giant asteroid strike could be game over for life as we know it. Just ask the dinosaurs. Oh no, that's right, you can't. They're all dead. Nuclear war could see millions die instantly as bombs pelt the world's biggest cities in an atomic rain, with the rest of us to follow later as the planet's living creatures perish in the famine of a nuclear winter. We could also see mass species extinction, destructive weather anomalies, and wars over water resulting from climate change. Finally, there's the prospect of a humanity-ending virus that spreads across the globe at lightning pace and eradicates anything that walks on two legs and likes to watch Netflix. Rewind to the start of 2020, and a lot of people thought we were already living through that last doomsday scenario. But bad as it's been, COVID-19 clearly isn't the virus to end all viruses. Or at least it isn't the one to end all humans. So what is? Scientists have a lot of different possible answers to that question, but to me, it's obvious. Zombies. Now, I want to take a minute to talk about hair loss, because I've had people close to me start to lose their hair as early as their 20s, and it's always an upsetting experience. If you're in the same boat, then you're not alone. Did you know two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? But the best thing you can do to prevent hair loss is take the initiative now and do something about it whilst you've still got hair left. I like Keeps because it makes treatment super easy by delivering your hair loss medication every three months directly to your door so you can say goodbye to awkward doctor visits and waiting in pharmacy checkout lines. There's a reason that Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors, and hundreds of thousands of men trust them for their hair loss prevention medication. If you're like me, you're probably not ready to lose your hair just yet, but prevention is key. The faster you act, the faster you'll see results, and the sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. So if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, do something about it. For a limited time, go to keeps.com forward slash 42 or click the link in the description below to receive 50% off your first order. Anybody who's watched a few crappy B-grade horror movies knows that it's only a matter of time before we're all in the middle of a zombie apocalypse caused by a mystery virus that turns people into undead monsters hungry for human flesh. So it's probably a good idea for us to start planning for the inevitable. When the zombies come, what should we do? And more importantly, will our species survive? Well, I'm sorry to break it to you, but science says no. Or at least a study conducted by a bunch of physics students at Leicester University does. In fact, according to their calculations, when the zombie tide inevitably rises, we don't even stand a chance. After just 100 days, there would be fewer than 300 humans left, outnumbered by zombies more than a million to one. Within a year, the human race would be wiped out entirely. To arrive at this cheerful conclusion, the students used a model called SIR, SIR, named after the three categories of people that are identified when mapping a contagious disease. S, or those susceptible to being infected, I, or those that are infected, and R, or those that have recovered. It's a standard model used in epidemiology, which is one of those abstract scientific disciplines you'd never even heard of two years ago, but now sounds as familiar as zoology, psychology, or proctology. 
That's because an epidemiologist studies the cause, spread, and control of diseases in populations. You'll remember them from the news broadcasts over the last 18 months or so. They were the ones who kept arguing with each other about who should stay at home and for how long. The Leicester University study replaced the standard SIR model, susceptible, infected, and recovered, with the more apocalypse-appropriate SZD model, susceptible, zombie, dead. Their calculations were based on the assumption that each zombie would bite only one susceptible person per day, with a 90% chance of infecting them with the zombie virus. They also left standard human birth and death rates out of the equation because, uh, quite frankly, in the space of 100 days, what difference would that make? After the study was published, a few people made some smart observations about how adaptable humans have been as a species, and the likelihood of us finding clever ways to respond to the army of the undead. So the physicists re-ran the numbers, this time assuming that people would get better over time at killing and avoiding zombies. They also figured that humans would make babies faster than normal presumably because nothing turns people on more than hiding from a herd of walking corpses. Under the new conditions, the research team calculated humans would actually win, taking just over two and a half years to wipe out the zombie swines. Then, with some dedicated shagging, it would take only 25 more years for the human population to start recovering from the onslaught. Happy days! But that is a massive swing in fortunes for humankind, so let's take a closer look at some of the factors that might come into play when predicting our chances of surviving a zombie apocalypse. Let's start by looking at the disease itself. Evolutionary biologists think viruses naturally evolve to find an optimal virulence, which means the perfect balance between multiplying within the virus host and spreading throughout the population. If a virus is too virulent, it might kill its host too quickly, giving it less time to infect more people. Ebola is far deadlier than COVID, but COVID has killed far more people because it's less virulent and much more contagious. At the other end of the scale, we have the viruses that make up the common cold. They're usually not too virulent, which means the chances of death or serious illness for the host are low and the host is more likely to carry on life as normal, giving the virus more chance to spread to other hosts. The downside for these viruses, though, is that they don't establish themselves strongly in the hosts, so most people's immune systems will recover fairly quickly and start fighting back. The zombie virus is a little bit different. Seeing as it kills pretty much everybody it infects, we can assume it's incredibly virulent. But in this case, killing the host doesn't stop the virus from spreading. In fact, quite the opposite. The resulting zombie becomes a tireless virus spreading machine. But how that transmission happens is also really important. Most zombies in popular culture pass the virus on through direct physical contact, like biting. That's a plus for us, because diseases that are communicated indirectly can spread far, far faster. Think of something like tuberculosis, which is an airborne disease, flu that spread through droplets when someone sneezes, or malaria that moves through vector transmission, which is when a carrier, in this case a mosquito, transfers the disease from one animal to another. The fact that zombies have to get in your personal space to turn you into one of them is pretty terrifying, but it's actually kind of a good thing. It's easier to escape from a zombie than it is from some microscopic droplets floating in the air all around you. Your chances are also related to the incubation time of the disease, which is the amount of time between being bitten and being fully changed into a zombie. In World War Z, the novel, it's anywhere from six hours to a week. In the movie version, it's a matter of seconds. And in most other comic books, films, and shows, it's somewhere in between. Whatever the incubation time is, you basically have that long to get the hell away from a freshly bitten victim. Would you be able to outrun zombies, though? Scholars disagree on this particular point. In The Walking Dead, zombies generally move slowly. But in the movie World War Z, they travel at a sprint. In the Living Dead trilogy, they're slow. 
In Dawn of the Dead, they're fast. Either way, what's the best way to react? Generally, there are four main ways to respond to the spread of a virus. Hygiene and sanitation, quarantine, vaccination, and eradication. Since washing your hands is unlikely to be a big zombie deterrent, no matter how many times you sing the happy birthday song, I think we can take hygiene and sanitation off that list. Vaccination could slow the spread of the zombie virus, but you'd still be at risk of being bitten and partially devoured by a zombie, which is a suboptimal outcome from a public health perspective. Besides, even if vaccination made us 100% immune, it would set up a pretty awkward situation in which we'd all be continuing with life as normal whilst zombies still roamed about, raising tricky questions like, do zombies have rights? And should zombies be paid a minimum wage? No, it seems to me our only two options are quarantine and eradication. The eradication part is generally thought to be done via a shot to the head or being set on fire. So let's assume those two work and move on. What should be the best way to approach quarantine? Rounding up potentially millions of zombies would be fairly tough. So quarantine in this case would probably look more like hiding in terror until all the zombies have gone away. But where should you hide? Researchers at Cornell University tried to answer this exact question a few years ago. I've no idea why academics are dedicating so much time to this, by the way. To better understand how real diseases spread, they built a statistical model of a zombie plague and predicted how it would spread across the United States. Not surprisingly, they found anyone living in a high-density urban environment was basically walking zombie food. The virus would spread so quickly that few would escape. But once the virus began to move into rural areas, its spread would slow down due to the sparse population. In their example, the Cornell researchers predicted it would take a full month for zombies to move from New York City to upstate New York. The study's findings identify remote places like the Rocky Mountains or pretty much anywhere in Canada as the types of places you'd want to be when the zombies come. Which is why I'm broadcasting this video from a cave in Siberia. You can't be too careful when it comes to having your intestines ripped out by a walking corpse. Of course, when the human population is decimated, there'll be nobody left to run basic services like energy production. So whether you're hiding out in the city or the mountains, you'll need some pretty solid survival skills. If you're suddenly getting the urge to pause this video and watch some Bear Grylls clips, I understand. The study was stochastic in design, which means it factored in a reasonable degree of randomness to make the results more realistic. Interestingly, depending on the exact parameters, sometimes the zombies won and sometimes the humans won. Though, whatever the ultimate outcome, the picture still didn't look all that good for us. But don't be downhearted. There's no reason you shouldn't be able to dodge the odds. As long as you have a shotgun and ammunition, food and clothing, and the ability to build shelter and make fire, you'll be fine. Just pack your bags and head for the hills. Oh, and be sure to take 97 random strangers with you. As you'll know if you've watched my video on the dangers of inbreeding, projections suggest that 98 unrelated people, that's 49 breeding pairs, would be the minimum number required to restart a human population on a distant planet. Recommendations are to aim for 500, but really trying to convince 250 women to head off and live in the mountains with me would never work. Trust me, I've tried. If you need any more tips on how to get ready for the great zombie takeover, please contact the Pentagon. They have an official document titled CONOP 8888, also known as Counter Zombie Dominance, that maps out what the US military would do to protect non-zombie humans from threats posed by a zombie horde, including chicken zombies, vegetarian zombies, and evil magic zombies. Military representatives claim the document is only a creative tool for training purposes, but it still raises the question, if the Pentagon is getting ready for zombies, why aren't you? Thanks for watching.
Good news, you can now pre-order my new book, Bread and Circuses, What Did the Romans Ever Do For Us? It's a wild and witty journey for a thousand years of unexpected Roman history. Told in a refreshing way, and packed full of incredible and unbelievable stories. Copies are selling out fast, so pre-order yours today to lock it in. Thank you.